Welcome to the Health Fix Podcast, where health junkies get their weekly fix of tips, tools, and techniques to have limitless energy, sharp minds, and fit physiques for life. Hey, health junkies. On this episode of the Health Fix Podcast, I'm interviewing Dr. David Dizer. He's a naturopathic doctor just like me. He is out of Vancouver, British Columbia, and he is one of the founders of Noble Naturopathic. He is also a podcast host as well, the host of Personalized by Vitamin Lab. And I was on his podcast not too long ago, so I hope you can check that out. But today we're going to be talking about metabolism. We're going to be talking about high-tech testing, such as the PNOE, metabolic testing. We're going to be talking about working out fitness, how that plays in, resting metabolic rates. We're going to get a little geeky, but trust me, it's going to be fun and you're going to get a sense of what you can do if you're fed up with where your metabolism's at and you really want to hone in on things, Dr. David has the answers. So let's introduce you to Dr. David Dizer. Hey guys, welcome to the Health Fix Podcast. I have Dr. David Dizer on and I'm really excited because I did a podcast with him personalized by Vitamin Lab. And we had a great conversation on that and I was like, oh yes, let's talk about your specialties. So here we are. So Dr. David, welcome to the Health Fix Podcast. Thanks for so much. Thanks so much for having me, Janine. Really uh, grateful to be here. Well, you know, you have such a broad range of experience and in particular, the metabolism school, we got to talk about that because it's probably the number one thing that women over 40 come to me about. They're like, hey, I'm seeing things slow down. It's not cool. I don't want to gain weight. My body's looking different than it used to. How? And so anybody who is focusing on, let's say, saving women from their own madness, hand, you know, like hands, <laughs> like high fives, thumbs up. I'm all about it. So tell us a little bit about you in terms of becoming a naturopath. I'm always curious about other naturopaths. What brought you to the bright side of medicine? If Thanks for asking. So I wanted to be a physician my whole life. I wanted to work in, in medicine, help as many people as I possibly could ever since I was young. Um, but when I became an adult, I realized that my interest didn't sort of align with the typical, the conventional pathways. And so I had experience working in a chiropractor's office when I was young. I had many family members who benefited from alternative care um, in typically in cancer care, really. And when I was in the Navy, I wanted, I, I still did want to be a, a physician. I wanted to be a naval physician. But at the time, it didn't suit the, the pathway for me. It wasn't like, it wasn't going to be happening. And so I was living in Victoria where naturopathic medicine is really, really popular. And I met a few people, loved what they were doing, learned that they were doing uh, manipulation. They were doing adjustments, learned that they were practicing primary care in our province. And also learned that they were you know, doing evidence-based natural care. So I had sort of like the benefit of all three. I could work in physical medicine. I could be a primary care provider and help a ton of people. But then also I could help people stay away from medications as much as possible. And so I ended up uh, applying, got in, went, went for it. And then right away jumped into sort of like integrative cancer care because that's what benefited my family so much. And I got a ton out of that. And I felt like I was able to help a lot of people very early on in my career, which was really cool. Isn't it funny how, how a lot of us come in from cancer care? That's kind of how I came into the naturopathic world, didn't know anything about it. And same thing with acupuncture. I had no idea. And, and that's the interesting thing about the physical medicine side of things. You can see, you know, the immediate results you can feel people's energy, you can work with them on, on that level. And gosh, it's, it's just so fun to hear other people's stories and, and how you come, you came to it. Now you had mentioned before we hit record that you grew up just on the border of New Brunswick and Nova Scotia. Were there, were you having to travel very far with the family to see naturopaths there? How, how did it work? Cause I know at this point, you know, there's more naturopaths in Nova Scotia, but I'm guessing back then there's maybe it lasts like tell us the story. not many or none yeah. absolutely yeah i yeah, know yeah. we're talking about 15 20 years ago now uh, they were traveling my family members were traveling to moncton new brunswick to an apothecary so they were traveling to receive herbal medicines from a from a sort of like a natural pharmacy place very cool yeah and and that's the story i hear a lot 
for folks in different provinces in in Canada, even today, you know, they're all, it's kind of spread out. I mean, even in Wisconsin, we don't have a lot of naturopaths, you know, Washington State, West Coast, definitely, like you said, lots of naturopaths in Victoria, Vancouver, you know, those areas, but sometimes it's a little bit few and far between. So I'd love to hear kind of how folks connect with. Oh my gosh, for sure. And I work, I would like, I work on a street in Vancouver with the most naturopaths of any street, I think in North America. So oh. I, I like completely opposite. The one street where everyone said not to work on is where I ended up working on because it, it just suited my lifestyle. So, it, you know, it's kind of unfortunate that it's, it's really difficult for, for naturopathic physicians to open practices in small towns, but it's building, it's, it's really building, becoming more popular in Nova Scotia, all across the Maritimes, really, and Atlantic Canada in, in general, there's a lot more naturopaths now, which is really cool. I'm I'm excited to see it. I love I love the growth. I love to see that people are embracing it, but also just that, you know, our word is getting out, right? And you have such a unique let's say like program that you have um and and especially skill sets where you're combining fitness which absolutely love and then also working in metabolism working in some of the iv therapy and so guys we're going to talk about that a little bit more today what got you into wanting to work with metabolism as a whole and creating the metabolism school well i have kind of kind of a funny story like i i'm i was an, an athlete in college i played basketball for the royal military college of canada back when we were in the the university league and we had an opportunity to play against some of your great schools and get our 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 our, our ourselves beat pretty pretty badly we play, actually had an opportunity to play against west virginia which was really cool d1 school which was really fun we got i think we got beat by 60 points anyways after college, of course, I was at the Royal Military College where we trained all day. It was very physical. I was a, sort of like a 400 club athlete, which is um, someone who reaches all the athletic pillars, basically. So we were training all day long. And then I was playing varsity basketball in the evenings. And uh, after college, um, all that output went basically to zero. As I entered in a naturopathic school, you know what the demands are like. It's very, very intense. The output went down to like a short walk, you know, kind of like at the end of the day. And I gained 50 pounds and I had been an athlete my entire life. In fact, I want to talk about my, my athletic journey as a, as a, as a high school athlete as well, because it kind of ties into metabolism school a bit, but I had been an athlete my entire life. And I was then at 50 pounds overweight and I could not believe it. And I said to one of my professors in naturopathic school, I said, I can't believe this is happening. Like I am eating less than I was eating before because we had unlimited food. It was military college. It was a well-funded program in the, in the country. Unlimited food. Everyone ate all day long. And everyone was very lean, of course, because we were training so much. And then to gain 50 pounds, I thought, this is wild. I was actually studying chemistry and I was in biochemistry. I knew all about metabolism at the time, but didn't consider how impactful actual metabolic rate is on your like sort of like lifestyle. Like what happens when you go from training four hours a day to training zero? What happens when you go from um, eating unlimited food to eating what, what, what really ended up being a small amount of food? What happens to the body? And so I think I lost a bunch of muscle and gained a bunch of fat. And that really inspired me to think more deeply about metabolism. And of course, we were training for longevity, for prevention. He's one of the tenets of naturopathic medicine is to consider prevention, of course. And so we were talking about the role of obesity, uh, how it's related to disease and how it leads to disease. And, and uh, I was freaked, freaked out. And so I got right into tightening up my metabolism, of course, lost all the weight and uh and it's, you know, my career has sort of been focused on that kind of in the second half. I'm 10 years in the second half of my, of my career has been heavily focused on helping people with their metabolic rate. Hmm. Isn't it funny how you like kind of like get the career started and then you <laughs> then you evolve into like what you initially were like, yes, this is why I'm doing this kind of thing. It's yeah. Oh, totally. Completely. It's it's really cool in our medicine, though, that we get to have these different kind of pathways yeah. Uh, within our career, like, uh, you know, 20 to 30% of my day is still integrative cancer care, but there was like, there's like a metabolism piece to it because we measure their metabolic rate and we help them eat enough so that they don't lose. So they don't experience the sarcopenia of, of, of what well, typically what happens in conventional care. Yeah. So, so we know how much calorie they need to be eating and they know, we know how much protein they need to be eating. We can track it. We can track the impacts of metabolism, uh, impacts of chemotherapy and radiation 
on actual metabolic rate. So, so we have this pathway where we can do that, but then we can support people with weight loss. But then also, what about chronic disease? Well, we we're talking about obesity. So there's a weight loss piece, but also the fittest people live the longest regardless. Right. And so we have this pathway that's sort of um, the chronic disease prevention, chronic disease treatment pathway where we still are able to use the metabolism device. So it's like my, my career has just become so right. fun. It's the best. I love it. I love it. You're still in the game at the beginning. Now you get the, yeah, it's, it's neat to see how you incorporate it and it like evolves yeah. over time. Now, one of the things that struck me in terms of your programs that you have is that you have this technology known as PNOE metabolic testing. And I had to look it up because I was like, huh, what does that mean? I hadn't heard of it before. So can you explain to folks kind of what PNOE testing is? I'm pretty sure that a lot of folks haven't heard about that before. They're thinking blood tests. They're thinking maybe like a DEXA scan to see what their body fat percentage is. Give us a scoop. Absolutely. Well, it, you know, in in other countries, physiologists have their own practices and they measure metabolic rate. It's just typically the device is connected to the computer. So for example, at all the major universities across our country, the physiology departments have metabolism assessments device, you devices, you breathe into it, it measures how much carbon dioxide you exhale, mm -hmm. but it's going through a tube um, and the, the sensors are telling the computer live what's happening with your carbon dioxide exhaled. Mm -hmm. The only difference with this device, and there's a series of other devices like it out there, um, it's Bluetooth. So it does a data dump every 30 seconds. So the hmm. sensors uh, attached to the mask, it goes to a pack on the person's back and the actual um, measurement is completed there and the data is sent via Bluetooth to the computer um, every 30 seconds. So I don't get a live stream of data. I get these batches of data that are dumped. Okay. Um, but so it, it's, it's the same as your conventional metabolism analysis devices. It's just mobile. So I was first excited about it because the American Heart Association said that the, the in a, I think it's in atherosclerosis in 2017, they published that the, the people with the highest VO2 max live the longest regardless of their cholesterol, blood pressure, and blood sugar status. And then there's a line after that says, oh, and it can be tested in office. And I knew that there's a physiologist at our hospital here who measures metabolic rate, but I never figured out like, how do people see that person? Um, and it's, it can be tested in office. So I thought how, looked it up right away, found this Bluetooth device and and went, and I've got right into it. This was just over three years ago now. So now we've tested 700 people's different metabolisms, uh -huh. both at rest and during exercise. So we have this like insane amount of metabolism information, like actual real life stuff that I can come on shows like yours and talk about. And it's been really cool. That's, that's neat. So over 700 people, you must be seeing some trends. You must mm -hmm. be seeing kind of some some data outputs. Are you guys doing any resource, research or writing any papers or anything or just kind of taking the info in and, and utilizing it to help? Oh, you? I wish we were doing research. Yeah, I wish we were. No, we're, we're not. We don't have the capacity yet. We have two people trained and a third one coming soon, a second location opening up. And then hopefully that will give us some space to be more organized and to consider mm -hmm. um, projects like that. But right now we're just sharing information uh, within the group so that we can help the people that we're seeing as much as possible. But wow. yes, we've seen some trends, my goodness. And and it may be like your, your very typical trends. I guess the, the key, the key thing that people come in for is they feel like their metabolism has declined and then they come in, we measure it and they say, yes, yeah, we say yes or no. But also we get to say, if it's a no, why do we think that's happened? Just through like a few questions. I'm sure you can imagine them. Do you sleep well? What are your hormones like? Um, what's your stress been like? And have you had any nutrient deficiencies? Like we can kind of check the boxes. That's aside from diseases and disorders, of course. Yeah. But then if it's normal, then we can show them what a meal plan looks like. That's a deficit if they're trying to lose. So they can know exactly what the portions should be to see if they've actually done, done it before. Mm -hmm. If the physician says, move more and eat less, all of a sudden we have a program in front of them that shows them what that actually means and provides predictable weight loss. Uh, this morning person came in, they're 11 or they're, they're seven weeks out of their pro, uh, since they did their test. Uh, we were supposed to meet after eight weeks, but we ended up meeting a week early. We did six pounds per month. So we were expecting 12 pounds, but it's been, uh, seven weeks and they're down 11, like mm -hmm. exactly 35 year old female exactly lost 
the the amount that we predicted they would lose with the deficit that we that that we created. It's unbelievable. It's it's so cool. Wow. Wow. That's neat. That's neat cuz I mean a lot of us, right? We're we're kind of guessing and and I even have a device here called the Lumen that measures the carbon dioxide and so folks could do this at home, but I still feel like even with the home devices it seems that there's still a lot of questions if there's not someone with you all the time kind of helping. And I shouldn't say all the time. It's not like you're following your people around, but, you know, having someone guide you in terms of the information that you guys get and, and the actual, like, this is what you should be. be the accountability, the accountability piece is huge. There, there's two real pieces, right? There's the evidence piece. Like you laid there for 10 minutes and then we took the smoothest two minutes of your breathing to mm -hmm. determine exactly what your resting rate is over the course of 24 hours at its lowest. And then we're able to compare that to the basal metabolic rate, which would be sort of like the predicted resting rate and tell you if you're a good burner or a bad burner. But then also there's a plan to suit it. So if the metabolism is normal, here's a plan that's going to be appropriate. You don't have to count calories. You just follow the portion sizes. So what I'm trying to do with this idea of metabolism school is I'm trying to bring the educational piece to the world. Like, here's what we know about metabolism so far. Here's the impact of thyroid hormone. Here's the impact of having low iron. What does it mean to train every second day to your actual resting rate? Like, what does that do? Mm -hmm. So if we pull out all these educational pieces, I think that we could have this metabolism forward or metabolism first lifestyle mm -hmm. that can be incredibly supportive. And even if a, a say a person believes their metabolic rate is low, but can't, doesn't have access to this test. Well, that's fine. If you follow the educational pieces, you can kind of check all the boxes, right? Oh. Like you can, you can check the testosterone box. You can check the estrogen box. You can check the, the eight hours of sleep box, the stress reduction box. You check all these boxes and then like not fasting, for example, consuming enough protein, strength training, doing cardio every second day. Like you check all these boxes, all of a sudden there's not, there's nothing else that could have been done for your metabolic rate anyways. So then you can go with the predicted values. And that, that's the idea. I want to have this educational piece that really supports the public for people who won't have access to this test. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So independent of the test, you can still do this. Now, I think what a lot of people are, are kind of looking at in terms of the metabolism is, is what I, I heard you mention testosterone and thyroid. A lot of people are like, what, what kind of testing do I really need in terms of things? Are you guys doing blood tests? Are you doing saliva? Are you doing urine tests for the hormones? Kind of what's your, what's your like gamut of testing for metabolism focused types of clients? Oh yeah, that's cool. We have, we have access to all of them, of course, and we use all of them. So we individualize the care, you know, you know me, my whole theme is like personalized, individualized. Right. That's my whole thing. That's why I love my podcast. Cause I get to talk about, uh, ask people how they personalize their, their care. But it, when it comes to hormone testing, we absolutely personalize care and we only will go in all in on testing. If someone has a, a low metabolism, like this is the example where someone's trying to lose weight and can't. Right? Okay. So they come in like for, for other people who have actual low test, low uh, hormone symptoms, of course we test, but let's say someone's coming in and they have the suspect they have low metabolism and they haven't been able to lose weight. And then we do the resting test and it turns out their metabolism is low. Like we predicted it using the Harris Benedict equation at 1800 calories per day, but it actually came back at 16 or 1500 calories per day. Well, then we have to go into the, we have to have some sort of line of questioning. Like we have to figure out how to best allocate resources for testing. So mm -hmm. say when someone has symptoms of low testosterone, you know, low libido, low sex drive, for example, um, they have, you know, they used to have more muscle mass that, you know, they feel like they're weakened. Um, then it could be valuable to test testosterone. And there's a few ways of doing it. Like we'll use a simple blood test for total T if we just need to have like a basic a basic assessment, but of course we'll do saliva testing and urine testing. If we want something a little more detailed, we want to go for a bioavailable. If we want to go for the actual metabolites of testosterone to see the whole cascade, we do the urine test. But very commonly what's happening is, is we're seeing uh, women whose estrogens have gone low, uh, say for example, in menopause and their weight has gone up. And so it's, can be very valuable if they have a low metabolic rate to have a look at estrogen progesterone because they do play a role. And so um, we, we do a lot of that. And we'll use in that circumstance, either saliva or urine, depending on the amount of information that we need. If they have symptoms that would um, 
require us to know about the different progesterone metabolites, for example, whether it was some stress symptoms or some insomnia type symptoms, or if we needed to know more about the estrogens, like there was a genetic predisposition to, for example, increased estrogen levels of one of the three types or increased estrogen receptors or, or metabolites, then we may want to consider looking at those because it's a really, really good test to see the whole picture, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think, I mean, I think it's important to test. I think it's important to kind of have some of the info at hand, right? So what we're working with, obviously none of us, you know, treat specifically on just the test, you know, we treat the person, but there, the data is helpful in this case. Now, when it comes to exercise and fitness and say you've got someone who is athletic, maybe they play college sports, maybe they're playing pickleball right now, since that seems to be all the rage, or, you know, they're trying to stay active. And they're like, man, I'm, I'm physically moving every day. And I my, you know, am I just not doing enough intensity? Am I doing too much? How do you guys gauge that based on the PNOE metabolic testing? Are you are you looking at resting heart rate? You know, or how, how does that work? How does that factor in? Are they trying to get fitter or lose weight or what is the deal? Like, what is the end goal for them? Like, we typically start with that, right? Like the VO2 max test that we do with the device gives us our VO2 max and the max amount of oxygen they can consume at their peak, um, milliliters per minute divided by their kgs of body weight. So body weight does play a role in VO2 max, by the way. You know, you want to be fit and lean. But we also get nine other metrics. So we're looking at measures of oxygen consumed divided by the heart rate. So as the heart rate rises, the consumption of oxygen should rise at a certain rate. We get to see their tidal volume, like how much they can pull in per breath and how fast they breathe during exercise. We get to see the efficiency of breath at the end of the test. So when they're breathing super fast, how much oxygen the body's actually consuming. It tells us a bit about the lung, a heart muscle connection. Mm. We get to see metabolic scores for calorie burn. So we see about uh, metabolic efficiency at the low end, like whether they're burning too many calories or not enough calories at the low end. And then again, at the high end for mechanical efficiency, like they're going all out, are they burning 30 calories a minute? Like, is it outrageous, an outrageous level of calorie burn? And then we also get to see the recovery capacity. So when we do a ramp test, this is a ramp test to exhaustion. We get to see if they're in the, in the first minute of cool down, if the heart rate comes down 30 beats. And then if the second minute they clear all the carbon dioxide that was built up in the body. So we get all these different metrics and say someone who is trying to be better at pickable, right. then we get to pick, okay, it's it's classified for us as limitations. The physiology team will classify the, the scores. These are lab-derived scores, except the VO2 max as evidence-based, obviously. But, the, but all the other scores are lab-derived, but it's a good lab. They give us limitations. What we would predict for someone, same age, height, and gender. Um, and then we get to work on those limitations. So for example, you know, for an agility sport like pickleball, we're typically thinking, can you express this power, this ability to get to the ball at the end of the event in the same way you could at the start of the event? Well, that requires a significant level of endurance. You need to have this aerobic capacity to do the same amount of work at the end so that you can recover those ATP stores, so you can recover the creatine bonds, so you can express those when times are tough. You don't wanna be fatigued. Well, the device tells us if your low-end cardio is not good enough, depending on your fat burning versus carb burning in the first few minutes. Say you have an endurance sport. Well, so endurance sport, we can go for um, what is the actual heart rate that's in zone two and how much fat is actually being consumed for fuel in that heart rate. And so what we do for our endurance athletes, athletes is we try and shift that thing all the way to the right so they're burning fat as at, at as fast of a pace as they possibly can be. And it's the worst for them when they switch over to carb stores too early. They get fatigued. It's unbelievable. So they say, you know, train slow to um, to to run fast. Well, we train really, really slow for them for very long periods of time, and they get more efficient at burning fat. So we we find the limitations and we program on on the on the weight loss side. We just find how many calories they're burning at every heart rate, and say if you train here for this number of hours, we can add that onto the deficit, and. While you're doing that, hopefully we're picking something that's not going to make you hungry and tired, but if it does, message us and we can change it. And so that's kind of how we program the calorie burn side of things. Okay. Okay. So it's, it's a little trial and error, which, you know, with anything, 
you know, we're going to have that. And I think that's really important for folks to hear that there's going to be some, you know, it's, it's not like you're going to get this data and that's the end all be all there, there has to be a little bit of playing back and forth to see, you know, which direction things might go. Now, well, it tells us though, it tells, it's the coolest thing. Sorry, Jenny. It tells us exactly which direction to go. The, the question is, can we send the right stimulus for that person? Mm -hmm. So for example, say it tells us that, you know, their fat burning efficiency at low intensities is not good enough. Mm -hmm. No, they need to train as much as possible during the week at low intensities without losing their fast twitch muscle fibers. Like oh. that was my problem in high school. Like I wanted to dunk the basketball. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be able to do this. And so I bought all the jump programs that were available in the nineties. Like that was my thing. I bought them and I did them because my discipline was insane. I followed them very closely. But I also ran cross country and I trained at night. So I did the plyometrics. I did the, the, the heavy, heavy weights. I did all the leg work during the day. But then I kept up my cross country times. I ran 3K every single night and longer runs on the weekend up to half, um, up to half marathon runs and did really well in cross country. Of course, my genetics you know, put me in a position where I had a ton of slow twitch muscle fibers. I kept those and I developed them. And I never gave my body a chance to adapt to the stimuli I was sending it during the day. I never built the fast twitch muscle fibers. I never was able to dunk the basketball, even though I found I, I found evidence-based strategies to do that. I, I, had the, I had good resources, but it never worked for me because I was sending two signals. Mm -hmm. So we always want to be sending the right signal at the right time. We don't do endurance training on the same day as zone five sprints because it wipes it out. We don't do weight training on the same day as zone five sprints because it wipes out the benefit of the zone five sprints. So we're able to get the limitations from the test and then take an evidence-based approach to programming, which is minimum two days a week on its own of the stimulus you're trying to send. For some people, that is enough. For some people, it's not enough. So the trial ends up being like, what is the actual volume and intensity at which you need to create this stimulus? And that, of course, we is easy to iterate as you go because you can just ramp up something and tone down something else. That's why I became a strength and conditioning coach too, to try to like be able to figure out when to turn the dials in which way. Mm. And that's been super, super valuable combining that kind of uh, approach with the data from the test. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Now I understand a little bit better because yes, I think for a lot of people, that is a big question. Am I overdoing it? Am I not doing enough? How many days should I be doing things? What do I combine together? And, and, you know, for endurance and for strength and for improving in a sport, that's completely different than someone who's like, I just want to target fat loss. Yeah. And, and so in terms of fat loss, could you give us an, an example of what that would look like in terms of someone looking at zone training, looking at combining, looking at, you know. Absolutely. Example. No, totally. So, like so whenever it comes to fitness, we have to individualize the programming, of course, but f fat loss individualized programming is highly dependent on your ability to follow the nutritional deficit. Right. Like the most important thing is a nutritional deficit because we program 70% of the results, 70% of that calorie deficit from the meal plan. Mm -hmm. So it, it really, the exercise calorie burn is quite minimal when you look at the actual total volume. Say for example, we're, you know, we have a resting rate of 1500 and a daily activity burn of 500 because they have sort of like a desk job, which is everyone. And then we have an exercise burn. Say we're doing four days at 400 calories per day. Then we would uh, take that 1600 divided by over the seven days to get about 200 calories per day and add that onto the total. So now we're at 2200. If we want to lose a pound and a half a week, we have to eat 750 less. Mm -hmm. So we're programming there. That's where we're programming. So we're staying at that 750 less than the total daily energy expenditure, whatever it takes to stay in that. So let's say that 400 calories that we thought we were going to get from exercise four days a week is something that we have time for and we can do. If a person is will really well trained, then we take their limitations and say the best choice for you would be to train for these limitations because it's going to help you get fitter and you're going to get the right amount of calories. Say they needed to do some zone four tempos. They're doing equal amounts of zone four and zone two because in zone four, it's kind of short. They don't tolerate lactic acid well enough. We should train there. Well, here's the calorie burn that's going to happen. And the benefit of doing zone four training is you're going to have a significant afterburn. 
for the next 48 hours, the resting rate is going to be higher than we found today, which means the results are going to be like a little better, but also it might make you hungry. So you got to check in with that. Let's say, for example, within this, within this whole thing, we had someone who had a low muscle mass and they were eating, um, you know, you know, we had them, we had them eating at 1450. We had them eating at 1450, but their muscle mass is low. So there's, there's a risk here. We have to work on building their muscle so that we can make sure that their metabolism is going to stay strong when they reach their goal. We don't want them to lose muscle, to go from a low state to an even lower state. So they need to strength train. So we have to send this signal to the muscles that we need them to be growing. And we can do that in a deficit. We found that out many, many times here. It's unbelievable the results were, that we've had turning fat into muscle, um, hypothetically, but it actually shows up on the page, which is so incredibly cool. So we have to train for that. So the stimuli would be two to three times a week for every muscle group. Um, so that can end up look like looking like full body three days a week. For someone who's never trained before, now they've got the bands, right? They're going through the bands and doing some band work at home three days a week, and then walking for the rest of the calorie burn, something like that, so that it's not making them too hungry because the weight training might make them hungry. Mm -hmm. So we have to individualize it. From a metabolism standpoint, we can get afterburn from more intense work. We risk the hunger and the fatigue because we're eating in a deficit, remember. For the untrained person or the person with low muscle mass, we have this responsibility to make sure their metabolism comes out at least the same or better when they reach their goal so that maintenance is really easy. And that means that they're going to need to be participating in strength training of some sort. They could work with a trainer. We have one who we, we send people to. Um, but really it's about sending the right stimulus. So for, for a lot of people, it ends up being like dance class or it ends up being like spin class or whatever they can do to start integrating something that is signal sending to the muscle tissue that we want to send to. And all of that will lead to fat burning because they're in a deficit. Now, if we look at just fat burning, like during the movement, it's only low intensity movement that causes fat burning. Like you, you only, you, unless you're going to run for like over an hour and then you burn through the glycogen stores and then you start tapping into fat again. But there's a lot of other complications that come with that one. So we, for fat burning, we just look at low intensity work. So we do the device spits out the fat max. So we get to see at what heart rate they're burning the most fat and how many calories they would get at that heart rate. That's what body composition pros do. You know, they just lift weights and then they just walk for three hours on an incline. That's what they do. And it works like crazy. It works so well, but who has that kind of time? So for the person who's like looking to see, you know, I'm, I, now is not the time for me to get fitter. I'm just trying to reach this goal to prevent cardiovascular disease from the obesity that I'm suffering from. Well, let's walk on an incline for as much as possible just to maximize that fat burning, not worry about afterburn. We have the test with 24 hours of no exercise. So we get to see what the resting rate is like there. We're not really considering afterburn. We're just making sure they're burning fat during their exercise. So we do do that. Lots, lots. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things I'm hearing that there may be some confusion out there and maybe some folks who are listening might be like, wait, you said that you're going to have me burn fat in a deficit. And I would love for you to help clear up some confusion because on social media, there's a lot of folks saying you can't be in it. You don't want to be in a deficit because if you're in a deficit, it's going to go negative on you and you're not going to get the results that you need. Help folks kind of through that a little bit in terms of why someone might say that online and really what is, is truly happening, what you've seen with your clients. Oh, with, with like really long-term lack of eating. But I mean, it's it's pretty rare to have your metabolism go down because you're not eating enough, for, right? It, it doesn't happen in a short period of time. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. So it happens when you lose muscle mass. Mm -hmm. It happens when the mitochondrial function declines because we have, we have some levers we can pull. Mm -hmm. We have mitochondrial function. We have mitochondrial density informed somewhat from by the muscle mass, like the actual total volume of muscle. Mm -hmm. So let's go through some examples. Some people can fast for long periods of time and their metabolism stays really good. Some people, they fast for a day and we're seeing declines. It's going down yeah. and it's incredibly individual. 
think about these mitochondria and think about their function. Like we have lots of data about improving mitochondrial function, do cardio, train high intensities, train low intensities, mitochondrial function will get better. But we don't talk enough about mitochondrial decline, whether it be from nutrient deficiency or from inactivity. Right. We have some people here who have metabolisms that are 500 calories less than predicted who do not have hypothyroidism mm -hmm. or are medicated appropriately and their TSH, T3, and T4 are optimal. Like we have that. We have a few who are like have resting rates less than a thousand and, um, you know, should be 14 or 1500, but all of the biomarkers that we would check their disease for are normal. So mitochondrial function is like this real wild card. So let's go through some examples. It's super easy for men to maintain muscle mass. It's, it's easy. We're carrying around bigger bodies. And so we're sending a bigger stimulus just by getting up out of the chair right? So the muscles are getting more stimulus with the movements that we have. We have more testosterone. It's easier for us to do, but still when men fast, sometimes their metabolism goes down mm -hmm. for women. It's probably a little quicker. It's probably a little bit faster in my experience. And that may be for all those, the opposite of the reasons I just shared about men, totally risky to be doing fasting for long periods of time. If you don't have a body composition scale, if you're not tracking your muscle mass, if you're not subjectively journaling your energy and how you're functioning. Mm -hmm. So we do this, we do this, right? Like, let's say we, 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 what do we have for mitochondrial function? We measure lactic acid here in the practice. So we have some people with chronic fatigue syndrome. When we prick their finger, check the lactate level. It's hot. It's hot. They're, they're, they're making too much lactic acid. It's like they're sprinting, but they're at rest. The mitochondria are not doing their thing. There's probably something up with the mitochondria. Mm -hmm. But what if you're at home? How are you checking in on this? Well, you need to stay strong. You have to stay strong. You have to keep the muscle mass. And then also the energy has to stay pretty good. So the, the question really is about what how are we figuring, how are we like going through the the nuances of online physician, um, you know, very uh, like clear statements like this happens to everyone. No, we have to like know that that is absolutely not true. We have some people here who think their metabolism is in the tank, but it's actually optimal and they've been eating too much for a very long time. And it's, you know, it they're eating less than what their partner's eating. So it doesn't feel like they're eating too much, but maybe their partner's metabolism is like way different than theirs everyone's mitochondria are unique, just like the rest of us are unique. It's just these little organelles have significant control over how much energy we're producing and expending. It's good that you say that. And I was hoping that was where you're going to go with the mitochondria because that's where it, I come down to with a lot of folks, you know, and, and, you know, there's so many gurus out there. You got to fast, you got to fast, you got to do this, this amount of fast. Everybody does the same thing. And I'm like, I don't find that to be as as good um, of a blanket statement of everyone does the same thing. It is individualized and and definitely, you know, toxicity levels, methylation, things of that nature. Um, I'm guessing you go down those rabbit holes with folks too when you're you're kind of looking at someone's metabolism that's a little wonky. When you're like, huh, what's what's up here? Tell us a little we bit do. about how those play into someone's metabolism, especially methylation as a whole. Oh, I mean, great question. Yeah. I don't have a ton of experience. All we do, we, although I do work in this realm occasionally, I don't have enough experience to feel confident in, in any one statement because I've seen people respond incredibly well to your typical protocols and other people respond incredibly poorly mm -hmm. to what we would call your typical protocols as, as poor methylators. We, I find that there's, it's, it's really difficult to know exactly what to do for the person in front of me. And so I, I sort of, um, I sort of keep an, keep an arm's length from it in, in my metabolism experience. I haven't had a ton of need to actually think about the genetics of, of methylation, um, only on the hormone side of things, uh, on the detoxification side of things. But typically the person who's coming to me, um, needs to know, how little to eat and how much to move. And so we make a program that fits that. 
on the, on the, on the other part of my day, like the other 50% of my part of my day, when people have ser serious anxiety and they've already had the test done, well, then I feel like I can comment on it a little bit. But other than that, I kind of, I try to stay away. It's an interesting thing that you mentioned that because I think a lot of folks, when they feel like their metabolism is broken, they will dive towards the most intricate aspects of the mitochondria and, and get in the weeds. You know, what type of B12 should I be taking? You know, this and that. Um, I've also seen different pathways of folks going right into IV therapy to try to reboot mitochondria. I would love for you to speak to that a little bit too, because I know you said you kind of keep an arm's length, but I would love to hear kind of what, you know, how you're using IV therapy and how you explain it to folks about metabolism and how that plays into things. Definitely. Uh, I would, I would say I keep an arm's length from the methylation conversation <laughs> when talking about metabolism, but IV therapy I'm all about. It's amazing. Yeah. So, but I would say like before that, um, uh, the, the thing that we focus on when, when people are unsure what to do for the mitochondria is cardio. Yep. Like it's running. It's, it's, if you can't run, it's biking. If you can't bike, it's recumbent bike. If you can't do that, it's a dance class. It's like something that you can do for cardio because that increases mitochondrial function. Then we have to think about if the mitochondria has enough resources. So, um, you know, I, I use IV therapy in chronic fatigue syndrome and, and for people who have incredibly low metabolisms and get good benefit from it. I see it as a bridge. It's, it's a bridge to getting enough nutrients in through the digestive tract because that takes time. Sometimes there's damage. Sometimes there's um, inefficient absorption and we have to work on it and it can take months. And so IV therapy really is a bridge to that. We don't have a standard IV program for everyone. We customize, individualize the programming. We go based on how people are feeling and we try to give ourselves time to optimize for absorption. That's mm -hmm. how I approach it. Gotcha, gotcha. And say someone's digestive system is, is doing okay and um, you've done some of the metabolic testing in terms of let's say an oat test you know, or a nutrient valve Genova, something like that. Those of you guys who are listening that don't know what I'm saying, organic acids testing is one of the ways we look at vitamin and minerals. We look at what the mitochondria are doing in terms of breakdown um, of your fat, proteins, and carbs. But when you use this, are you also, in some cases, supporting cu with custom vitamins, using using vitamin lab, basically, um, for customization on, on that, like someone's let's say a custom multivitamin or a custom mitochondrial formula for an individual? We do it. We do it all the time. I, mean, I use vitamin labs so much. Uh, of course, there, if, if anyone isn't familiar, vitamin labs is a sponsor of my podcast, uh, personalized, and I just love them so much. We use all the professional brands in our practice, but we use vitamin lab a lot for those custom formulas following one of those tests you're describing. Mm -hmm. And I see it as being in incredibly valuable. For one, it saves people money. And for another, you're avoiding all the things that you really may not need. And that can make a significant difference for the for the mitochondria. As you know, with the oat test, you get to see the organic acids assessment. You get to see if there's some imbalance in the metabolites that would be present, for example, in your mitochondria. And what's happening in the Krebs cycle is sort of elucidated by this, by this assessment. And if something is overdone, if you consume too much of one nutrient, one of the cofactors, you can find that this whole process is hung up. Mm -hmm. Now, it's pretty rare. It's pretty rare. This is separate from, um, this really ends up being separate from the typical weight loss program that we make. 99% of our weight loss, not 99, 90% of our weight loss programs is like pretty cut and dry. Metabolism mm -hmm. is just about normal. Here's the deficit follow this, get used to these portion sizes and do it for this number of weeks and you'll be good to go. The other say 10%, okay, there's something else happening here that we need to think about. And sometimes we catch things and I love the organic acids test for that. And I do think that it informs the, the protocol really, really well, rather than just saying like, here's L-carnitine, alpha boic acids and B vitamins, NAC and CoQ10, just go for it. We get a good idea of exactly what to do. And I love that. Yeah. I find it refreshing to hear that it's the basics, really. Um, 90% of the time, 
And I think a lot of people, like I mentioned earlier, it, we we tend to think, what are all the things that are broken? You know, it's it can't be what I'm eating. I've tried that. I've done this. I've done that. And so oftentimes I will get a little pushback from folks when they go, oh, you're just going to tell me what to eat and how to eat it. That's not going to do it. I've done that. So I'd love to hear kind of, you know, obviously you've got the testing to back you up, right? Versus someone just recommending like, here's your macros and it's off the top of their head, right? They're just right. guessing, you know, and and I'll be, I'll be honest, like in the beginning of my career, I did do a lot of that because I was working on, you know, in a fitness kind of realm and, and we would just kind of eyeball it at first, but you have the data behind it. So when you have the data behind it and you're telling folks like, hey, really, it is just this. Do you also, because because I know you have a comprehensive program, are you also combining the exercise or will you just do nutrition first? No, we and, do both. We do okay. both. Absolutely. Because okay. we want to benefit. We want to benefit from the calorie burn during exercise, but we also want to get fitter. We have this data. We might as well use it. But I would say even for people who didn't have the data, let's say, the, you know, before I did this, I just did low carb plans. Like that mm -hmm. was my whole thing, low carb and fasting for like seven years. And 50% of people lost weight incredibly effectively and did so well. And it was great. But the other 50% of people like, what is this? This doesn't work. Like this is, we're just, we're just estimating. We're just guessing. We're just trying some restriction thing mm -hmm. and I feel worse off. Mm -hmm. So what am I supposed to do? So now let's say I'm in a scenario where I can't test. There are situations where we can't do that. And how would I counsel someone? Well, we have the predicted metabolisms, right? We have the predicted calorie burn. We can we we always predict daily activities anyways, and then we could predict exercise calorie burn. All the treadmills do it, all the watches do it. So we can get an idea, we can get a ballpark. That's what people like a lot of online fitness people what they do for for weight loss, right? Is they take your um, they take your weight, you multiply that by 10, that's the number of calories you should eat if you want to lose, multiply it by 12 for maintenance. That's the kind of thing that people do. Um we can take the estimated calorie burn, but then we can take all the strategies to optimize for metabolism. And so let's let's go like low hanging fruit here. Um, it, I, I don't want to make it sound too easy because correcting an iron deficiency is not easy. No. Building an activity pattern, right? Building building this daily movement pattern that either increases your daily activity output, so we can then estimate higher or actually is dedicated exercise so we can add on something new, that's not easy. I was recently talking to someone who, who uh, Dr. Gupta is a, is a weight loss physician, and he talks about activity patterns. He talks about like, what are you doing? What are your, what are, what, what is your daily movement like? So I compete on the Apple Watch with 5,000 other people for calorie burn. That's the only way I can do it because I'm an athlete in my heart. And if I'm not competing, I'm not moving. I'm sitting behind this desk. It's unbelievable. So we have to figure out what is that thing for you that is going to get you afterburn? How are we going to pull this one lever? Mm -hmm. That's not easy. That's not easy. Um, some things are just a given, right? Like menopause is happening. Before menopause, the actual loss of metabolism is really only related to muscle loss. Like in, over, over large epidemiologic trials, metabolic rates decline with muscle loss before the age, I think it's a, before the age of 50. After 50, it's 1% per year, which is not zero. This is aside from muscle loss, but it's not zero, but it is something. Mm -hmm. So I would suggest that for some, like, because that's an average, for some people, it's way more pronounced. It can feel like it needs to be supported. So we can measure that. Um, and if we're not in the office, of course, we can just take it seriously and act upon it. So that's, I don't want to be like, spend this whole time with you making it sound like it's really easy. Just measure and do this, do that. No, these are things that can be done at home. Sleeping through the night can be worked on. It has a significant impact on metabolism. It has an impact day to day. When people do uh, recurrent metabolism tests, the actual variability is only 50 calories. So the, the, the tests are incredibly accurate, but let's say some, that's it. That's all other variables the same. Let's say someone didn't sleep through the night or, um, has a viral infection. Their metabolism is way different the following day. Like it's totally different, their resting rate. And so we have to consider that other things are happening. So we can, we can tie all these up and it's, 
can be very difficult. You say, oh, I sleep better, but how do I do that? Well, that could take like three months to figure out. Mm -hmm. But then once we figure it out, it's amazing because metabolism goes up and everything becomes easier. So that's why I'm saying like, we could check the boxes. We can go through these. And, and just following people online who feel like they have all the answers, like I don't claim to have all the answers. I claim to have a list of things that could be optimized. And when we optimize all of them, I do think things get better and I have the luxury of measuring to make sure things get better. One of the easiest ones mm -hmm. is, uh, is fitness. You know, like we have done so many tests for athletes now. This whole stream is like taking off. Everyone wants to know their VO2 max, which is really cool. They burn more calories at rest. Athletes do. Their resting rates are higher. Yeah. But their calorie burn during exercise is lower. At a heart rate of 100, they're only burning four calories a minute. Everybody else is burning six. So it's very obvious that having this fitness first, this fitness first thing where it's like, we have this data for VO2 max. Maybe we should actually try and get fitter first. Well, we're going to get the value of the calorie burn, whatever. That's great. We're going to get the afterburn. But also what's going to happen long-term is the resting rate is going to be better. And we're going to be able to challenge ourselves at higher intensities during the exercise. And uh, that's going to be good for a whole assortment of things, including hormone. Mm -hmm. I think I think definitely intensity is something that we overlook. I, I think in, in, especially in fitness, it is something that's overlooked, especially with the hormones status and, and seeing where someone is on, on that level for sure. And, and just kind of one of the things you were, you were mentioning as you were talking about, it's not easy is you had mentioned a viral illness and, and sometimes we'll have folks that'll have an acute one, of course, that'll mess with your, your metabolism. But what about the folks who have the chronic reactivated mono? chronic reactivated CMV, which would be your chronic fatigue patients, of course. But I will sometimes see people that have these and they still work out like on a regular basis, but intensity trashes them. Mm -hmm. How would, how would you approach, you know, what, what do you, you know, obviously you're going to do the same kind of testing things of that nature. What would you, let's say, what would you say to someone like that? Who's like, I know I have a chronic viral thing going on. I haven't kicked it. I need to figure that out. What would be your approach in that case? Well, we measured lactate at rest. And that I think provides a, a ton of value we, because you can then start something that's supporting the appropriate macronutrient usage. So let's say, for example, we're, we're finding someone has elevated lactate at rest and, you know, it's present on some of the organic gases tests as well. But like, I like, I like testing with the meter and just having this like live thing. I think it provides a ton of value because we can consider the supportive care for, for example, fat burning and glycogen usage. But, but what are the lifestyle aspects that go into that? Well, you know, in this scenario, the immune system is is overactive. And if we have any challenging work, then all of a sudden the there can be post-exertional malaise and that really impacts someone. Well, we have seen people's metabolisms decline over time in conditions like this because of the deconditioning. Mm -hmm. Typically when someone has a viral infection or any sort of immune response or um, let's say, say an autoimmune flare or uh, even a cortisol response for mental emotional stress. Acutely, their metabolisms go up. Chronically, their metabolisms go down. So we try to think about that and take and use the framework we have to be metabolism supportive. How many people have chronic uh, um, viral infections who don't have uh, a normal iron store? Like my understanding here is that the chronic fatigue the chronic fatigue provincial practice shoots for a ferritin of a hundred. Like the, they're not shooting for 50, you know? So like I'm, I'm more conventionally there, there are some metrics that are being used to support people. They test vitamin D here in chronic viral infections. They, they optimize for this and everybody comes back low. So mm -hmm. when someone comes in, 
and they have been through this kind of like torturous thing. We can't just say, you know, go to an exercise. We can't even, we don't even really do the ramp test because it's, it can throw you out for a whole week, but we do have personalized care. We're looking at say the most common nutrient deficiencies, iron, vitamin D, B12. And we're finding that very often they're not what we would call optimized. And I'm saying optimized partially from a conventional standpoint, because I know the program is doing certain things with ferritin and then optimized from a basic lab standpoint. Our labs have vitamin D set. Our metrics are different than yours in the States, but normal vitamin D is 75. And pretty much everyone in, in, in British Columbia who doesn't take vitamin D is below 75. So, you know, we always find something that we can be working on. We do a lot of like nutrient assessments and yes, we find low carnitine. Like we mm -hmm. find it. Mm -hmm. um, one of the biggest ones is the recommendations for protein intake. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we, we have a recommendation here of decimal eight grams per kg, but then they want us to exercise for 150 minutes per week. But then if we're exercising for 150 minutes per week, well, are we entering into more of a, more of an athletic requirement for protein? So we've got the Canadian Society for Nutrition suggesting that maybe an appropriate recommendation might be between 1.2 and 1.6 grams per kg. And so we're, we're like, well, maybe it's glutamine. Maybe the, the immune system really needs a ton of glutamine when it's been burdened by an infection. So we do a ton of amino acid therapy. Yes, we do the protein therapy. We make plans so you know what the portion sizes are, but that's tough. Like it's kind of gross how much protein you have to eat sometimes to get your body back in order. Yeah. But glutamine can make a big difference. I feel like I'm a naturopath from the 1990s. It's amazing. It's so cool. So all of a sudden now we're combining glutamine and, and D-manose and L-carnitine and people's metabolisms are getting better. We do a lot of iodine tests which is kind of wild because like the main cause of hypothyroidism in North America is Hashimoto's disease. But then we measure urinary iodine and find that it's low a lot. And, you know, the, the thyroid hormones are looking pretty good, like not too bad. Mm -hmm. Too much iodine is terribly toxic and make a person so sick. But how cool is it to catch it on a test, support it and have a person feel a lot better? Now, I think it's John Hopkins that says that 50% of Americans are deficient in magnesium and Health Canada, I think they said recently at 30% of Canadians. Um, if we're not getting enough magnesium, oh, and I look at my own requirements for sodium, it's like two grams a day. I'm no way I'm getting two grams a day of sodium. These requirements, there's no way. The, defi the food is deficient in mineral. We're all doing certain things with our diet and trying to get fancy with things and finding that, well, okay, maybe we're like fully deficient in like 10 things. Right. So long-winded answer to say that we always find something to work on and very often working on that thing or that group of things makes a big difference. Yeah. No, I think, I think, you know, it goes back to the title of your podcast, personalized, right. And, and we've gotten so far away from personalized. We, we have all this one size fits all, of course, in the modern medical model, and I think a lot of us are stuck in that thought process. So we watch different folks on Instagram. We watch different gurus and they're telling us like everybody responds the same. And I think that's the most important takeaway. I really want folks to think about during this podcast is that we all have individualized things going down and we all have our own different, you know, deficiencies, different things happening. Now, when it comes to mitochondria, you had mentioned the you know, training and, and training folks to be fitter and using that as kind of like a jumping point. And that's kind of one of my main jams for, for everybody. I want folks to consider, okay, so you may be gaining weight. All right, let's, let's take the weight out of the picture and really think about like, does, did anyone, you know, on their deathbed say like, I really wished I I'd lost that 10 pounds, right? No one's going to say that. And I'm sure you you have been down this pathway with folks, you know, I think a lot of folks would say, I really wish I enjoyed my last 10 years of my life because I could do X, Y, Z, right? Yeah. And so at the crux of metabolism work, the mitochondria, ultimately at the end of the day, you're improving mitochondrial function and, and helping folks, you know, move forward. So I, I wanted to kind of loop it back to that in terms of the longevity side of things here mm. and why it's so important to think beyond the, I want to lose weight for the metabolism. Right. Speak to that to folks 
help help us spread the message of yes, weight loss is nice, but living a really amazing life is so much better. Definitely. Um, well, so many things to, to pull out here. Like the first is that I've taken all those longevity supplements <laughs> and they make me starving. I can't like, they make me more hungry than exercise. If I take Isn't NR, nicotinamide, riboside or CoQ10, I can't stop eating. I just can't. I have to keep going. And so I feel like they're, they, you know, they could have a, they could have a place, but for me, oh my goodness, I don't know if they're just really, I got to measure my resting rate before and after to see what kind of impact they're having on it. But um, they make me very hungry. So, well, you know, I come from a town um, where there's like, like most of our towns, there's lots of cancer. There's lots of cardiovascular disease. I work in a practice where I, I try to help people prevent those, but I see and I, and I know a lot of people who have been through chronic disease, whether it be in my own family with rare cancers or non-rare cancers, um, or in my practice, you know, when people pass away from something that's preventable, it's torture. It's super torture. So what I try to talk to, um, what I try to speak to really when I'm making these programs is, is the benefit that is that actually that actually is possible what like what can you get from this and part of the thing i bring it back to is the energy produced the actual metabolism that athletes have at rest their metabolic rates are higher they're actually making more energy we're measuring the byproducts and they feel good and there it's it's difficult to stay in tune with what feeling good actually is when you have felt bad for a very long time or you have been sort of like what would be considered suboptimal and i'm not saying like we're life hacking our way here or life hacking life away i'm saying like there are some things that can be done that could make a person feel really really good and part of that feeling is coming from improved mitochondrial function it's actually mitochondrial function enhancement and the strategies that are recommended by our governments are actually pretty good. Like 150 minutes of moderate intensity per week is a pretty good recommendation. Two and a half hours divided whatever way you like. The question is like, what's moderate activity for a person? Mm -hmm. And what, is, what would be the detriment of training less or less intense? And what would be the detriment of training more? How would that make a physiologic difference? What would that stimulus do? Mm -hmm. And so I like to speak to those things here's how we should spend our two and a half hours right now. Let's do it over here. Let's build two pounds of muscle in two months. If we do that, you know, then in the next two months, then we have this opportunity to improve our VO2 max significantly through two things, through expressing that muscle at higher intensities and through losing a bit of weight, oxygen consumed per minute divided by your kgs of body weight. And then we know now we're in this different group and all we did was follow their recommendations. We're just dividing up this time in different ways. If you're trying to lose weight, walk on an incline and eat less calories than you're burning. Okay, fine. We should measure your resting rate afterwards. By the way, we just had someone lose their first, uh, we had our first person lose hundred pounds. Nice. 15 nice. months. Really cool. So proud of her. Um, metabolic rate went down 250 calories, resting rate. Over, and so they lost a hundred pounds of fat, five pounds of muscle in 15, 15 months. So pretty happy with that muscle loss. Like that's not bad at all. Their metabolic rate, um, went down 250 calories at rest. And that's pretty good, you know, to go from 1600 to 1350 for their height, 1350 is actually normal. So, you, you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. Fat is not that active. It's not active. Muscle is incredibly active and it's active for a couple ways. Like it, 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 you have to move it. So your body has to make more energy to move it because it's pretty heavy and it packs in a ton of mitochondria. So we can, we can improve the density, the density of mitochondria. And when we talk about mitochondrial function, we're really not talking about the organ systems. We're talking about the muscle mitochondria. That's really what we're describing. So when we think about it that way, like, okay, the fat is not making much energy in total. You can lose hundred pounds and your metabolism is going to be like still normal for your height. That's wild. Um, the muscle mass is doing a lot of the lifting here. 
you know, it, it's doing a lot of the actual, it's having a lot of the actual influence. And so there's two things we have to do. We have to have an, a normal amount, which we would call like above the 100th percentile, basically, is what we're looking for. I have an in-body scale, but all the scales have like a normal level of muscle that you can kind of shoot for. Mm -hmm. And the scales at home are fine too, as long as you're tracking the trend. Like they're doing the lower legs only, I think. Um, yeah. But the trend is what's important. If it's going in the right direction, okay, it's working. Um, but then, so, so, so we have that, but then we can think about the fact that yes, we're having to move them, but also their actual ability to produce energy is dependent on nutrient, but it's also dependent on the signaling, which is quite complex. Oxygen to the tissues, nervous system intent, intending on actually making movements, all of that comes into play. So I just love, I love talking about this. I love teaching about all this. I think it's really, really fun. And people get a lot out of it. So from a longevity standpoint, we kind of bring it back to that. We're not all going to be athletes, but it's a spectrum. Mm -hmm. It really is. And um, higher VO2 max, people with higher VO2 maxes typically feel good. Like they feel really good at rest. And that's ridiculously important. So I like to speak to that as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because I think we're just, we're missing the boat a lot, unfortunately, on on mitochondria, on metabolism, where we're stuck in the wrong place and, and not thinking about where, you know, as society, right? Unfortunately, it's all about the weight loss, but we're not thinking about all the other cool things that can happen with our body to really optimize things and, and what it could be like. And, Absolutely. and you could just be fitness first and you could be protein first. You could be doing that. It doesn't have to be meat protein. My wife's a vegan. My kids are vegetarian. You know, I'm a pescatarian. We're, we're all about plant proteins. But it, but when we're trying to make a change, whether it be body composition change or fitness change, it's easiest if you think protein first and then build around and then fitness first and then track hunger and cravings and, and energy and go from there. And that's been the like, I think the biggest insight for the people that I've worked with, it's like, if we just keep those two things top of mind, then it's easier to stay on track. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I think at this point, we've given folks a really great idea of what you're up to in the office and what you're doing with metabolism school. I would love for you to kind of explain how folks can work with you, how they can dip their toes in, you know, even like, do you take folks if they come visit from out of country? Like give us, give us the story of how, how it goes and, and we'll go from there. Definitely. I'm in Vancouver, British Columbia. People come and see me from all over the, the all over the world. People come into the office because Vancouver is quite a popular city to travel to. But if you haven't been able to get your metabolism checked or your VO2 max checked and you've got a visit booked with Vancouver, of course you can see us. It's all primary, private primary care here in the naturopathic world. So people come all the time and, and we work with them when they're in the office here. For education, from, from an educational standpoint, I teach continuing education for the nutrition school, um, but I also have my own thing um, online that I'm that I'm building to try to teach these pillars. I'm trying to teach the boxes that we need to check. And that can be found, uh, the signup can be found at noblenaturopathic.com slash metabolism. So noble, N-O-B-L-E, naturopathic.com slash metabolism. There's a little sign up space there if you want to hear about how we're going to be helping people check these boxes just from a, from an educational piece. So that's really cool. And then if you want to hear more of what, of what we're talking about, of course, my podcast is called Personalized and I interview people sort of like you and I. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And, and that's anywhere you can find podcasts too, correct? It is. Okay, perfect. I want folks to hear that as well. Now- you know, I'm always curious, noble, naturopathic. Where's the, where'd the name come from? Give us the scoop. Oh, we like the ring of it. It ah. sounds great. But also, you know, we're trying to be evidence-based and we're really good team members. So we, objective data, check the box, right? Mm -hmm. Good team member, good listeners, the whole group of people here are just like lovely and very responsive and think outside the box and are incredibly supportive and holistic. And so we thought that it would be a, a, a good name for, for the clinic. My son's middle name is Noble. And uh, we just we just like the ring and it resonates with people uh, in, in our office. We have a lot of people who choose naturopathic medicine for their primary care yeah. because it's difficult to find a physician here. And people really resonate with it because we know when to use medications and we know when not to use them. Mm -hmm. And we're pretty good at teaching why we made the decisions that we made. 
So we thought it'd be a good, a good name to, to fit that kind of approach. I like it. I like it. That's awesome. So folks, if you're listening to this podcast and you're in the Vancouver, British Columbia area, now you know where to find a primary care physician that aligns with your mission. But also if you're struggling with your metabolism, you've got some help here too. And sounds like all the cancer care as well. So we've got all, all kinds of things you guys are up to. And um, we didn't even talk about cold laser. That's probably going to be another podcast for another time at this point. But these guys are doing a lot of stuff. Check out their website and, and that way you'll see more. And I'll put all the information in our in our podcast notes at drjkrausnd.com. My goodness, so much stuff. So if there is one thing, and I think you kind of already said it, but I just want to reiterate it. If someone's listening to this and they're like, I really want to get started on my metabolism right now and, and see if I can get like a leg up before I get a professional on board, what's one thing they can do to get started? We test people frequently because I'm super interested in how metabolism changes. When you train, when you exercise on purpose for just under an hour, you'll find that your metabolic rate is higher for the next couple of days. That, that may be, in my experience, one to 200 calories higher at rest in the following 24 hours, maybe a little less in the 48 hours. But it's something to work with. If you think your metabolism is slow, you can boost it a little bit by training every second day for an hour. If you get hungry from the training, you might want to try a different type of training. If it's making you overeat, it might be something to check in with. So exercising on purpose, we're not talking about the stairs in your building or walking around. Those are all really good and activity patterns are super, super important. Think about them as activity patterns, patterns of daily living. That's why I like competing for calorie burn on the mm -hmm. Apple Watch. But purposeful exercise on purpose every second day in whatever way you like, whatever way you'll do and watch your metabolism rise up a little bit. Awesome. All right, folks, you heard it here. You know what to do to get started. And of course, if you want to continue moving on with your metabolism, you can head over to noblenaturopathic.com and then it's forward slash metabolism if we want to look at metabolism school. That's correct. Got it. Dr. David, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Having me. What a great time and great questions. I loved it. My pleasure. Hey, fellow health junkie. Thanks for listening to the Health Fix podcast. If you enjoyed tuning in, please help support me to get the word out about the podcast. Subscribe, rate, and review, and just get that word out. Thanks again for listening.